provocative and a very cognizant of uh, the issues that are taking place not only in India but worldwide. It's more focused on it. And uh, our, our purpose in this session is really to provoke your mind and after listening to both of them who have their own viewpoint on how to combine, blend the elements of uh, IP and open source. And I have, as you know, has filed more than 570 pages in the name of individuals. Now, all the cost is borne by an IAF. All the rights belong to me. This is probably one of the only institution of this kind. Uh, similarly, when we license technologies, uh, there are, there's a freedom to innovators to choose what they would wish to do. But the benefit sharing framework that we have involves seven stakeholders and the share of innovator includes three checks. One for the innovator, one for the nature, one for the community. All the three checks are made in the innovator's name, but they are given separately. There is a cultural significance of this. In our homes, when food is cooked, the first bread that is cooked is not eaten. It is left for the birds or the animals. So we use that concept that this check, though it is in your name, it is not meant for you. How? I must be honest enough and candid enough to say that in some cases, people do use that money. They are so poor and they are so hard pressed and that they are under so much debts that they admit honestly that they didn't share it with the community because they were at that level of consumption. And we accept we, we, It's a learning process. So I will not claim that the effort that we are making has succeeded in every case. No, it has not. And the fact that it has not succeeded in every case and the fact that we are able, able to admit it means that there is a learning process. That there are ways in which we will learn it together and it is not going to happen in one day. So that's one part of it. I will also mention that the model of incentive that we follow, portfolio of incentives include material and non-material incentive for individual and group. So there's a matrix of material individual, material collective, non-material individual, and non-material collective. We have therefore recognized that one cannot rely on only one instrument of incentive. One has to have a portfolio of incentives. Many times we have seen that people who we have recognized at Shashti or an IF have been recognized by their village subsequently. <coughs> that is a non-material incentive. The community recognizes you, they welcome you, they celebrate, they have a village meeting and they honor you because you have been recognized by someone outside. Now, you like it or not, this is a part of mission culture. We seem to wait for recognition from the West or outside before we recognize our own genius. We have tried to change that. And I and Shashti have tried to change that. All the recognition that Shashti has done so far are non-material. We don't give a penny to anybody, except in few cases where we are supported in the we just kept it. NIF does give award money, but that is only a very small amount. Large number of people receive appreciation. The model that we have developed is that incentives need not be only for adding value or commercialization. It can also be for setting up their own company. So we are setting up now innovators companies in some cases so that they can take the benefit of the modern instruments of investment and commercialization to the extent that they can. But it is not obligatory, it is not in every case, it is a choice available to some innovators. Uh, Mansur Bhai Pratapati, who was supposed to be in this session, unfortunately, his wife is not well, so he had to go. He is one of the successful entrepreneurs who has <coughs> property worth 3 crore, which is about almost a billion dollars, 0.75 million dollars, beginning with a debt of about 19 lakhs, which is about um, 40 crore dollars eight years ago, and he makes clay refrigerator and clay plates. So, clay pan, non-stick clay pan. So there are cases where people have made a lot of money, but these are exceptional cases, I must admit. Large number of people, their lives have changed to the extent that they become more respected. Their self-respect has gone up, but a great deal remains to be done. So I will not take more time. Uh, I will also mention that in the morning, I recall the technology commons as a concept which emerged in Riyadh's thesis, Riyadh's Riyadh's thesis where which emerged in the case of a innovation of motorcycle based buying machine. We had a workshop of lead innovator and all the derivative innovators. And in that workshop this emerged that there was no way, no nothing gained by restricting copying of the technology even if it was patented. Once you buy had a patent in the US and in India for motorcycle based multi-purpose flying machine. But there were people who asked one question, I will stop with that. They said, ask Mansur Bhai, I have sold 40 
machines in my device based on its design, would you have been able to supply my village for the machines? Once I said no, my capacity is much lesser. And there were 25 other people who did the same thing in their villages. So the question was that the local demand, which cannot be met by a single producer, decentralized manufacturing is necessary, and derivative location specific innovations are must. Then the question people asked, what's wrong with that? What we're doing? Of course, there's nothing wrong. So then the concept of technology commerce evolved, where people to people copying is not only allowed but encouraged. People to farm is not. People to farm through licensing. And this model needs to be tweaked further. And uh, Shamanath and Nigel could help us in finding out from you all ideas and suggestions to make our portfolio of incentive model more rich and also to use IME in a way that it suits our culture and values. Thank you, Anil. As, as he said, my name is Adrian Smith. I'm the researcher and I work at Spru and the Stet Centre at the University of Sussex. And uh, I'm very grateful for being given this opportunity and being invited here um, to chair this session. Anil's done a fantastic job at introducing it. He's done my job for me, actually. Um, unfortunately, as he said, my supplies um, had to leave early, so we don't have an innovator, but hopefully there are innovators amongst you who can uh, in the discussion, draw on your own experience to illustrate and bring to life some of the issues. I should also point out that in the program on page four, there are some specific questions, so it's probably worth um, reminding yourselves of those as well. But I think the emphasis really is to try and kind of ground the discussions. Um, as a way of kind of opening that, actually, and um, I, I'd just like to flag up before, before Shannon does a few brief slides to set the scene. Is, is actually maybe to flag up um, that, that this sort of finding this way of sort of transcending IP or doing IP in an open source kind of way is a very laudable aim, but maybe there are some tensions in there as well. And I think it boils down to how we, what we consider to be innovation and how we can sort of frame innovation in this relation between generating knowledge and mobilizing resources, material resources, and finance to turn ideas into, into action. And I guess with the idea of intellectual property, I confess to not being an, an expert on this, thank you for showing that here. Um, but there's something about innovation being something that you can, be, you can isolate and fix and codify. It may be a product, it may be a, a process for doing something, or it may be a service. But there's a sense that you can kind of, kind of package it and, and, and protect it in some way. So I think that's, that's a, understanding perhaps innovation as, as, a, as an outcome or an event. Whereas I think, Another view on innovation that's kind of been popping up in discussions throughout this morning is to see innovation more as a process, an ongoing process actually, that's much more sort of networked and open and um, sees, sees novelties coming about through uh, interaction between different people and different actors that um, transforms people in the process of doing it as well. And it's much harder to sort of draw a boundary around and fix. And I think part of the motivation around sort of open source peer production and commerce by some of these really exciting new ideas we're seeing bubbling up from the grassroots globally um, it, it, it stems from that understanding of, of innovation. <coughs> but I think actually there's the, 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 the challenge is, say, quite different ways of thinking about innovation. So how can we sort of hold the two in, in the same frame at the same time in a way that really does uh, support and empower the grassroots? Having said my bit, being keen to hear your bit, I'll hand over to Shannon before we start this. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you, um, Professor Gupta, for inviting me here. Uh, I've been really looking forward to working with him uh, for a while, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's very fortuitous that you invited me at this time because we just got onto a project with, uh, uh, with the World Intellectual Property Organization that, uh, thankfully, due to a mandate from member states, is forced to now look at the informal economy forced to oh, come up exactly. with, yeah, I mean, so, you know, thus far their work has been limited to intellectual property in the formal economy, and now, because of Brazil and a number of other member states, uh, they've been forced to sort of look at the informal economy, and that project was ongoing, so, uh, so hopefully at the end of one or two years we might have, uh, you know, when this project started, it was very interesting, because uh, I think the, the, the assumption was, uh, what kind of IP regimes would suit the sector, and it was, it's like putting the cart before the horse. None of us really know how innovation happens in the sector well enough to 
to then recommend policy measures. You need to first understand what, what's really going on here. Uh, what are the incentives operating in people's minds? How is a creator sort of seen within communities? Is he seen as a disruptor or is he rewarded? And I find it fascinating that, uh, Anil, that you just mentioned that some form of a reward structure is sort of trailing or, or following uh, what, what you've done. So, so you, you acknowledge the mentor and then the community acknowledges it. So the incentive structures there seem to be uh, working in some ways differently uh, than what we might see in a proper R&D form of setup. And, and, and so it's a very exciting uh, a project. That, and, 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 and personally, for me, an intellectual challenging endeavor to just look at this. Uh, uh, and, and so I really be looking forward to a, a, a very uh, interesting discussion with all of you uh, as we move forward. Just look at this segment. Look at what are the various. I, I would really call it uh, appropriation mechanisms more than. I mean, I, I know the two of them are. Pinpointed here, intellectual property, and including open source. But IP is just one appropriation mechanism. And, uh, an appropriation I use in a very, very broad way to mean how do you derive value out of an idea that you have? So, how do you appropriate the idea in the sense? How do you create value from a creative idea that you have? And I think that's, uh, is, would, would that be okay, Anil, just expanding the scope to just look at uh, appropriation? And if we, if we were to look at uh, policy regimes, legal regimes, whatever regimes you want to help appropriate what would those look like, what should those look like. And I think that's really, Adrian, would that be the sort of, uh, the, really the, the, the focus of this, this discussion. And for that, we really need to understand how innovation itself is occurring in the sector. So I have a couple of slides, very, very quickly, I'll take you hardly five minutes uh, to just lay the tone and then hopefully open it up to discussion. So we, we have some very uh, pointed questions to ask you. So I call it grassroots innovations appropriation regimes. So what kind of an appropriation regime would you think of? Would existing appropriation regimes known to the formal sector, namely, and the most, the, 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 the most famous, the most popular regime that we have now for the formal sector to help appropriate uh, products of the mind or creativity or innovation, etc., is the intellectual property regime. Um, so what is, uh, uh, for those of you following the intellectual property debates, you know that a constant theme in these debates is just that you have a one-size-fits-all regime for the large part to cater to a variety of industries uh, and innovative sectors. Uh, and of course, courts and, and, and policy makers have adapted some of these regimes to, to cater to what we call technological specificities. So you have the same patent regime which says 20 years of patent protection for any idea that's new and inventive you have that same concept applied to pharmaceuticals, and you have that same very regime applying to computer software. And you can immediately see that there might be a mismatch simply because computer software shelf life is far less uh, than the shelf life of a drug. If you take the electronics industry and, and, and you look at the Apple Samsung watch, you'll, do, you'll know that the set of concerns posed by electronics, semiconductors, um, and things in that technology sector are very different than what you see in the pharmaceutical sector. So in the pharmaceutical sector, if you have a new drug, you might at best have one or two patents corresponding to that drug. So you have one or two patents underlying that drug, and you have a very, very costly regulatory structure, because it's not enough to have a patent on the drug, you need regulatory clearance, which takes many, many years, uh, and is expensive as well. Whereas in the electronic sector, in the high-tech sector, you have multiple patents per product. So just this one device could have about 100 patents covered. And so the, the dynamics are very, very different. Right? So, uh, and, and, and courts and policy makers have reacted, have been grappling with trying to create some sort of specificity uh, with, within these sectors. And that's a tension you find in the formal sector. Now you, you bring that into the informal sector, it's going to get far worse. Because the diversity of, uh, I, I wouldn't call it sectors, because they're not clearly defined sectors, but the diversity of uh, innovations happening within the informal sector is much vast, is more vast than what you find in the formalized sector, right? So the way innovation happens in a traditional medicinal community of traditional healers is very drastically different than what you might find in a village uh, that is agrarian, and you have innovations uh, that might occur within the context of, let's say, uh, newer plant varieties, newer breeding techniques, maybe newer tractors, agricultural implements. Um, and, and, and so the dynamics and the mode of innovation, the way it happens, everything could be very different. And, and, and therefore, the 
short point being that you might require a very different set of policy instruments. You can't have the same set of tools uh, to apply uniformly across the board to cover all innovations happening within the uh, grassroots or informal sector. Uh, if you take metal manufacturing, agriculture, handicrafts, <coughs> traditional activities, these are all very, very disparate uh, uh, fields in which you find differences in the way uh, that innovations happen and that communities or individuals appropriate the value or may not appropriate the value. Uh, and I use the term informal economy also, it's much wider uh, in, in, in one sense uh, than grassroots. Uh, and if you look at the work of Barbara Harris, right, she says almost 85% of Indian economy is informal. So it's a huge issue, and, and, and which is why the international UN organization that deals with intellectual property is now forced to look at the informal economy simply because in a lot of developing countries, that's the large, that, uh, the large part of the economy is really informal. So if you look at appropriation, and, and, and if within the formal sector, the, the one regime that comes to mind immediately is the patent regime. And you have this classic case that Professor uh, Gupta and NIF have been helped with. Um, this is a, an inventor called Apachan. It's a father son inventor duo. Both um, had, had, had come up with this coconut climb, uh, tree climbing device. The son had improved it slightly than what the father had. Uh, unfortunately, both are no more. They both passed away. Um, and, and this case is, you know, raises some interesting issues because uh, this technology was patented. And this was also fascinating because this coconut climbing device was not just restricted to the local area, but was uh, bought out by Boston ornithologists who wanted a bird watch. Yeah. And, and, and so it went, it truly went grassroots to global in one sense. Um, but, you know, I, I started looking at the patent issue here, and that's when it first struck me that, you know, a patent's really the way forward. I mean, is that an optimal legal instrument we're looking at for this sector for two reasons? One is most of these inventions that you see within the sector are, are very, what we call, incremental inventions. I mean, if you look at the prior art, if you look at the literature, um, and you ask the question, how inventive is this, you know, based on your standard patent concept, you would find that some of these inventions may not stand up because there's small, minor changes uh, that have happened, but largely valuable within those sectors. I mean, the utility cannot be doubted, but from just from a cognitive point of view, which is what the inventive step requirement under patent law really asks. It's a, it's a cognitive inquiry, you know. Given the existing state of the art in the literature, not just in India, but worldwide, and all that we know in science and technology, did the inventor really give us something that was significantly over and above what existed? And by and large, if you talk to most patent attorneys, they'll tell you that if you look hard enough, you could invalidate most patents. Simply because it's a, you know, I, I, I can, in hindsight, almost everything seems on inventive. <laughs> So you have a hindsight bias creeping into a lot of these inquiries. Uh, and so if you take a number of these patents, they're largely incremental advances. Uh, and so you have, uh, and particularly so in India, because in India, for those of you following the debate, we've set our standard quite high. Uh, because India's had a, a politically contentious history with pharmaceutical patents, and we wanted to keep our patent standards really high. And as a result of that, if you look at current cases before the courts, including one before the Supreme Court, it's very clear that the standard is a high one. So the patent standard has been pegged fairly high uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and you cannot have, within that patent regime, two different standards for the formal sector and the informal sector. And that's the problem you can face. Second is high costs. Now, anyone who's had anything to do with the patent regime, you'll know that the government cost is no cost at all. It's really the patent attorney's cost. And if you want a really strong patent with really good claims, you know, because the, the, two, the, the, the best patent attorneys will try and claim as much as possible for you, so, so much so that you can prevent a large number of competitors by giving away as little information in the patent. I mean, that's a two hour patent. Give as less as possible and claim as much as possible. And so the two art, and it's obviously an expensive art. You need to really pay through your nose uh, to get a good patent out. Uh, NIF has been getting pro bono support from a number of law firms. But for those of you working in law firms, you know that pro bono really means for lawyers working in law firms who are subject to billing pressures that one free Sunday in a year fairly comes. So the quality of pro bono work, in most cases, more so than not, is not on par with the quality of paid work. And so if you, if you flip through any of these patent applications, you'll immediately see, and I've done it, you'll immediately see the quality of drafting that goes into uh, any one of these patents for which the attorney is not paid is slightly less than what you might have otherwise. And so then the whole question comes up, okay, so if, if patents may not be an optimal 
uh, instrument to help appropriate innovation from the space, then what do you look at? I mean, do you just let it be open? Uh, do these creators and mentors, should they just publish? Uh, should we just help publish their new ideas and let it be? Um, and if that's the case, what do you do about the other form of appropriation, which is misappropriation? Because right? once you let it loose, you can't prevent somebody else from taking it and appropriating it, sometimes in unethical ways. And here again is a classic example that I think the NIM faced, uh, which is a cycle um, that was invented, I forget the inventor's name in the northeast of India. Uh, and the idea was that you, know, you have lots of bumps on the road, uh, so you have two options, either you can cringe, or you can say, let me convert the bump into an advantage. And this is what the inventor did, he said, if, if there are constant bumps, then I can actually use the energy from the bump. So getting into the bump, there's a lot of shock energy, and I can convert that energy into something useful. So it created shock absorbers, and as the bumps generated energy, caught by the shock absorbers, transmitted to the rear wheel, and the rear wheel went faster. So oftentimes you come out of a bump going slower, but here you come out of a bump going faster, because the rear wheel is propelled much quicker. Now this idea, I believe, was uh, spoken about at a conference by Professor Gupta, attended, at, maybe, I, I think it was at MIT, and within a couple of months, MIT students had filed a patent to come to games. Of course, in a different, I mean, they, they've shown how it works in automobiles. So uh, a jump from cycles, but still, the underlying idea was that of this grassroots innovator, uh, who unfortunately wasn't credited. And so you have a whole issue of uh, what I call misappropriation. So what do, what do we do about that? You know, if we, if we let it open, um, uh, how are we going to take care of this? The other mechanisms that you might potentially think of, given the problem of patents, if you want to really look at mechanisms to prevent misappropriations, or to help the grassroots innovator appropriate the inventions, the value of the inventions. Utility models. Now these are often called second tire patents uh, because they, they mandate a much lower threshold. So they don't require a very high inventive step threshold. You don't need to go and show that cognitively your idea is really, really superior and it makes a significant break from what existed before. Uh, some of the utility models merely require you to show that you are just new. You need not show your inventive. You can just show that what you've done never existed before. So it's a much lower threshold. Sometimes it also comes with a lower time frame of protection. So patents, may, patents are granted for 20 years uniformly because of a WTO instrument called TRIPS. But in utility models, you have a variety of countries offering 10 years of protection, sometimes six years of protection. So you could tailor make it a bit more. Uh, and utility models, uh, the Indian government is now considering it. And, and, and I think Professor Gupta is part of that committee as to whether and in what form we might want to implement this in India, uh, and the notion being that this could help, uh, especially grassroots communities and grassroots innovators, given that it requires a much lower threshold for protection, and it might be much less expensive. Uh, but we don't know how it will work. Experience from abroad has, has been very mixed at best. Uh, so you have Germany, Japan, a number of other countries that have these models, uh, and the German experience has shown that yes, a number of people have registered utility models, but the aim with which the utility model system was first initiated, which is that it was meant to cater to small and medium enterprises, that somehow got lost because the same big players, formal players, are the ones registering these as well. Um, in Japan, you had uh, an initially good uptake of utility models for a large part by small inventors, by small and medium enterprises. Uh, but now if you look at it, the number of utility model registrations have gone down because all these small inventors and SMEs that first used the system have now become higher grade inventors, so they all resort to the patent system, which is much stronger protection because it grants you 20 years and it grants you much more, you know, stronger set of exclusive rights. Uh, so the evidence has been slightly mixed in a number of these countries. Um, and as with any other legal regime dealing with uh, innovation and incentives, it's always difficult to get any conclusive empirical results. Um, so you, you know, so, so the best option is really to try it and see where it gets us, uh, and, 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 and keep recalibrating it as we go along. If we really want to test it out, branding again, you know, the whole debate on innovation and, and, and grassroots. This, uh, you know, it, there's, there's considerably less focus on this, but this would be a major tool. Uh, and if you look at the major debate between Ethiopia and Starbucks, they had a huge debate around particular kind of bean variety, Sidamo, and it was a trademark issue over Sidamo. 
uh, the Ethiopians finally won it. But that uh, one incident also demonstrated that trademarks could be a powerful tool and brands could be a powerful tool for appropriating value from indigenous knowledge and indigenous products. Uh, you have others resorting to uh, commercial relationships to build some kind of exclusivity and appropriation mechanism. Uh, so you have uh, these uh, water pumps that are leg operated. Uh, and when one of the uh, producers of these water pumps, what they do is they, 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 they tell you that you know, if you buy this, if you buy our product, because there are several producers of these water pumps, um, what you also get is after sale service. So if you buy anything else, once once you've got some damage, you have nowhere to go. You'll have to go and acquire a new product. But with us, we'll ensure that we give you very, very good after sales service. So there's a lot of commercial relationships that are also coming into these sectors uh, to help build some form of market exclusivity and help appropriate value, um, even outside of the patent system. Then you have trade secrecy. Now, this is a very interesting regime because this is the only regime that India has historically known for a large part. So, you know, most people come into the IP debate in India and say, Indians never knew intellectual property, it's alien to them. That's not fully correct. India did not recognize formal intellectual property regimes, but informal IP was always recognized through strong trade secrecy norms, which means communities held things as a secret. It wasn't protected by the law, but it was protected through very severe social sanctions in a lot of cases. If you, you know, an idea that belonged to a community, if, if some member of the community leaked it outside, in a lot of cases, there would be severe social sanctions. And so it operated as a sort of de facto trade secrecy regime, which means that what is held as a secret uh, doesn't leak out, and there's some appropriation value and protection value out of the fact that it's secret. So in the same way that Coke protects its ingredients uh, through a trade secret, uh, not through a patent. The Coke, the Coke ingredient is not known to the outside world, barring a select set of people, but that's protected as a trade secret because nobody else knows how to make it. In the same way, a number of uh, grassroots innovations uh, traditional medicine innovations are held by families and communities as a secret. So unless they want to give it out, it doesn't go out. And then we have something called unfair competition, which is another appropriation mechanism uh, which some countries use, which is the notion of fairness. So you might find that in the earlier case that I, uh, slide that I just took you through of the cycle and the MIT uh, inventors, the two students who had patented it, uh, is there a notion of misappropriation there? That this was really something that the, the germ of the idea came from India, from this grassroots innovator, uh, could you then take it and <coughs> proprietize it uh, and derive value out of it without attributing them or without sharing value? Uh, you might find a broad notion of unfair competition under legal regimes that could potentially help. And this, of course, I raised this point in the last session, so I'm not going to dwell on it in the interest of time. Uh, but really, uh, I, I think when we look at this entire debate, there are a number of things that the formal innovation sector can learn from what's been going on within the informal regimes. Uh, and, and one is just collaborative and community-based innovation. Right? And so we have open source innovation today in software, now being replicated in biotech, and a lot of other spaces. The Indian government's running a, pro uh, a program on open source drug discovery, where they're trying to use open source to discover a new drug uh, for TB. Uh, but all of these open source, community-based, collaborative innovation mechanisms, we see a lot of it within the traditional communities for centuries. So in a way, our current debates are, are you know, of, of uh, are seeing things that, that were already happening centuries back uh, within many of these communities. And of course the other uh, is, is, is the much bandied about word jugad. And, and you know, if I were to compress in one sentence, it basically means less is more. Right? With the limited resources, you're trying to innovate. And that is again something that we see very, very common to a, a number of the grassroots communities. And that is something that's being picked upon by the formal innovation systems now, articles in the Harvard Business Review and several others, which are now looking at really, you know, how do we get products that are more localized, that, that rely on less resources to construct uh, and, and create. Uh, and so with that, I'll just leave you and then uh, hopefully we can get some uh, comments from all of you and, and have a participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay then. So that's very helpful kind of run through various mechanisms. Thanks for that. Who would like to start? There's various themes in there. I mean, questions about incentives. Um, is the concern really about incentivizing innovation or maybe um, keeping open and nurturing particular forms of innovation, actually? It's not about sort of incentives, not sort of 